Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My apologies for getting started a little bit late, but we are here now with Professor Chris Impey and I'm gonna let him introduce himself and say hello and then we will go right to our first question. Okay, welcome everyone to the live session for the online course. Um, we'll just get right to it. The floor is open for your questions on any subject in astronomy. Okay, our first question, Chris, is from William Botterton, who sent an email asking, is there yet a way to detect magnetic fields around exoplanets? Um, interesting question. Um, and I, I sense there's a deeper meaning behind the question um, because a magnetic field of a planet is, is kind of a detailed property when up to this point, all we know about exoplanets typically is their mass and size, really global properties. Uh, the reason why magnetic fields are interesting is in within our solar system, the magnetic field is implicated in the habitability of a planet. So the core habitability of a planet obviously relates to the, the nature of the star, the distance of the planet from the star, whether it's in a liquid water zone, for example. And then, of course, it depends on the atmosphere that a planet might have. But magnetic fields are important because in the case of the Earth, um, the magnetic field uh, creates a shield. Um, deflecting the solar wind and high energy particles and creates a sort of more gentle radiation environment for any life that might live on a planet. So um, I'm guessing that behind the question is a question about habitability because if we could measure the magnetic field of some of the Earth-like exoplanets that are being found, we'd have yet another indication as to whether they might be hospitable for life. But the answer to the question, unfortunately, is no. We have no way yet of determining the magnetic field of an exoplanet. We're only just beginning to get into the kind of studies that can look at, for example, cloud patterns or the degrees of large-scale weather in the upper atmosphere of an exoplanet. Uh, but we have no instruments in play that use, are used for detecting or characterizing exoplanets that can measure magnetic fields directly. Remember, magnetic fields are actually, without direct space probes, are, are hard to measure within our own solar system. And we're talking about objects that are trillions of miles away. So the, unfortunately, the answer is no, but it would be very interesting information to have. Ready for the next question. Thank you, Chris. All right, um, and kind of as you alluded to, there are um, several people who have questions about the recently announced exoplanet that has um, water uh, in its atmosphere. So we've detected water in the atmosphere of this distant exoplanet. So people would, in general, just like you to explain um, but then also, um, what does that mean um, for uh, there possibly being water on the surface? Um, what does it mean that we've detected water? How did we do that? And what do you think about it? Right. Actually, the first detection of water on an exoplanet was over a decade ago with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope used its spectrographs and a back illumination from a star to look for absorption in the atmosphere of an exoplanet as it emerged from eclipses. And the extra imprint of water was found. Now this was, of course, a hot Jupiter or hot Neptune, I think. And so the water there represented steam. So the atmosphere was hot, the planet was hot, and the water was steam. In this case, the recent discovery of an object found in the second Kepler mission, the final phase of the Kepler mission, so it has a prefix of K2, um, this is a planet that is nominally in the habitable zone, and it is a lot larger than Earth. So the detailed conditions on the surface are a little hard to tell. Uh, again, we don't have direct information. So this is an indirect uh, spectroscopic measurement that can sniff out the chemical signature of water in the upper atmosphere of this larger than Earth planet. Um, and it's tempered enough that this water vapor in an upper atmosphere could well be raining out or falling onto a liquid surface with oceans and lakes. And that's speculation because we can't diagnose the surface of the planet. Uh, but this is yet another move towards the idea of characterizing planets where there could be life. Since we think water is a foundational ingredient for biology, every creature on Earth, every living creature has some component of water. Water is quite an abundant molecule in the universe, so it's not unusual to find water in an exoplanet. But to find it in a habitable zone exoplanet really does increase the likelihood that there is biology on this particular planet. We're not going to be able to answer that question, however, with any current instrumentation. Ready for the next question? 
Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, so our next question is from Matt Springer, who sent in an email. And uh, Matt would like to know, uh, you stated before that if we were to watch someone fall into a stellar-sized black hole, the observers will never actually see the falling person past the event horizon, and they would appear to be stuck on the edge because their time is slowing down. Uh, would that not apply to anything else that might fall in? Uh, if a star spirals into a black hole, would it just appear stuck on the edge of the event horizon with a red tint? Um, and that would seem to make black holes not black at all, but rather really red with all these stars hanging on the horizon. And that just doesn't seem right. Yeah, so it's just an important thing to sort of understand conceptually. Um, uh, first of all, just to back up for a person falling into a stellar mass black hole, uh, that, that is going to be an extremely unpleasant death by spaghettification. So that person is not going to survive the passage. So let's, let's prefer to talk about it in terms of inanimate objects or spaceships or, or just test particles uh, tossed into a black hole. What would happen to them? So the radiation is redshifted. What's happening is a gravitational redshift, which means as the object gets deeper into the gravitational potential of the black hole and approaches the event horizon, the radiation is redshifted, if you like, if you want to think of it this way, by struggling against the gravitational field. Redshifting, of course, is lowering in energy. And redshifting is, of course, reducing the energy and increasing the wavelength simultaneously. And in principle, at the event horizon, the redshift is infinite, which means the wavelength is infinite, which means the energy is zero. So no, there wouldn't be a piling up of images of objects uh, at the event horizon because each object, as it falls in asymptotically towards the event horizon, is infinitely redshifted and so is emitting no energy. So that deals with that particular issue. Now remember, this is a perspective for the external observer. If you were located on the object falling in, or you threw in a clock or something, um, the clock would keep normal time and fall through the event horizon and would, of course, become part of the black hole and increase its mass. So both things are true. The asymmetry asymmetry in the experience between the infalling object and the outside observer is just a natural consequence of relativity. Ready for the next question. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, so the next question is um, also from email. KJ Ambrose asks, uh, when viewing the moon through a five-inch telescope on September 7th, I saw a large crater that had a really smooth looking impact basin, except that it had an almost perfect straight line almost all the way across the diameter of the diameter of the crater. What could cause a straight line like that to form something like a low angle object impact? What, what do you think? Um, it's possible that a, a, a low angle impactor could graze the surface and carve out a channel. The odds of that, however, are, are really small, especially if it's inside a crater itself, which will have crater walls. And so it means the impact angle actually probably has to be a few degrees just to get above the crater wall and then into the crater. Um, and so the odds of that kind of a, a, an incident are extremely low. And even at some point, it would hit the surface and cause a crater. So it wouldn't just be a line with nothing at the end of it. Um, more likely, this is a geological feature. It is indeed possible in the basalt regions of the moon or other parts of the moon's surface that previous epochs of stresses in the lunar mantle and lunar crust uh, cause fractures and fault lines. Now, they're not typically strictly linear, but over some limited distance, they can be linear or appear linear. So if you look at the totality of the moon's surface uh, and the details of all the striping and geological features on the moon's surface, there are some that appear to be linear. So that's the most likely explanation, just natural geological effect, probably in the ancient past because the moon has not had a lot of geological stresses recently. Ready for the next question. All right, uh, the next question is from Taras Zgarski, who's on with us live, who asks, is nuclear fusion possible in the accretion disk of black holes? Uh, if so, then what are the heaviest particles or elements that can be generated there? Uh, not typically possible. The accretion disk of a normal black hole that now we're talking about uh, a binary system, typically, because an isolated black hole won't have an accretion disk. It, it'll be sucking in matter directly from the very low density regions of space, so not much material. Uh, a black hole with a companion, a stellar companion, will pull 
in an accretion disk in its equatorial zone. The temperature of that accretion disk, however, at the outer parts is a few tens of thousands of Kelvin, and at the innermost stable radius, so the innermost stable radius after which a particle plunges directly into the event horizon is about twice the Schwarzschild radius. So at that innermost stable radius um, for, for an orbiting particle very close to the black hole, the temperature is typically a few hundred thousand Kelvin, maybe as much as 300, 400,000 Kelvin. That's hot enough to make x-rays, but it's not hot enough for fusion. The weakest forms of fusion involving deuterium take place at about seven or eight million Kelvin, and hydrogen fusion requires more like 10 million. So these temperatures are very high, but they're well short of what's required for fusion. Ready for the next question. Um, all right, the next question comes from a live viewer, uh, Akashka Rani, who would like to know, how did the idea of alternate universes and a multiverse come about? Um, yes, yeah, a good question, because this, these ideas are tossed around in the popular literature quite frequently. Um, it's not a natural idea. I would say probably the precursor to the multiverse idea came from quantum theory, uh, and it's uh, Everett, one of the famous physicists of the 1930s and 40s, the many world theory, or the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics talks about simultaneous probabilities that no system is deterministic, and so there are multiple possible probabilistic outcomes for a particle or for a slightly larger system. And in the many worlds theory, this held that all of those possibilities and probabilities play out in parallel. And so the universe goes through a series of essentially infinite branchings each time there's a quantum probability or a set of probabilities, each of them actually occur in parallel with each other with some appropriate probabilistic number attached to them. This is the many world idea, and it has a flavor of parallel universes, that there are parallel universes where one quantum event happens and another parallel universe where the same quantum event had a different outcome, and that happens too. The multiverse, the modern multiverse idea emerges from inflationary cosmology and the idea that the universe had a quantum origin. So in the inflationary model, um, the impetus to the inflationary epoch, which expanded the universe from a tinier than a subatomic particle to the size of, say, a beach ball, a few meters across, after which it resumes more leisurely expansion, that this is driven by quantum processes and the unification of the forces of nature. And because you have a quantum process that's actually causing the initial expansion of the universe to a macroscopic object, uh, then the supposition comes that you're in a situation where there are quantum states that give rise to the universe. So why not have other quantum states in that same precursor situation we're talking about before the Big Bang uh, that also lead to other universes? And so the quantum creation of the universe suggests, by analogy with quantum theory from the 1930s and 40s, parallel situations where other universes are possible. Not all of these universes, of course, might expand in an inflationary way or have any finite size at all. They may be nascent or stillborn or not actually evolve in any way. Um, but that's the basis of the many world or parallel universe or multiverse idea. It has no experimental support. That's always worth remembering. Ready for the next question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the next question is from Gitanjali Rajulal, who sent an email asking, what exactly is the fabric of space-time? Like, what, it's, what is it made of? And what are its known properties? Does it exist outside our universe? And was it there before the Big Bang? Um, Space-time is a, essentially a mathematical construct. So in general relativity, uh, general relativity is a geometric theory of gravity. And so uh, general relativity doesn't really talk about stuff. It talks about the properties of space-time and how they relate to matter and radiation. So the space-time in general relativity is a construct that's defined mathematically. And to a mathematician, or formally, it's called a manifold. Now, a manifold is a, is a space in mathematics that could be three-dimensional, like our space, could be four, five, six, any number of dimensions. It's because it's a very abstract quantity. Um, and as in our universe, consisting of mass and energy, which curve space-time, uh, the manifold of space-time in general relativity can have arbitrary curvature. It can be extremely close to flat, as our universe is, or it can be 
it's highly curved in on itself, like the event horizon of a black hole, or something in between, or some very convoluted or even chaotic geometry. So the basic answer to the question is, is that space-time is not a physical thing at all. It's a mathematical object in general relativity, and it's the, it's the backdrop, if you like, for the physical objects of the universe, stars, galaxies, gas, and dust, and so on. Ready for the next question? All right. Um, the next question is from, um, sorry, uh, one of our uh, viewers who can't be with us who sent in um, an email asking, uh, so Anthony sent in an email saying, can you explain how Hawking radiation leads to the evaporation of a black hole? particularly why when virtual particles are formed outside the event horizon of a black hole and one escapes with its energy but the other falls in, why would this contribute to a reduction in the mass of a black hole as its energy and mass were never in the black hole to begin with? Um, the simple answer to that question is that the creation of a virtual pair involves the extraction of energy from the vacuum. Um, and so you have gained something. Some, something has been created from vacuum potential. Uh, and if any part of that, what's gained, what, either a particle or an antiparticle, leaves the situation, which is Hawking radiation is when this process happens at the event horizon, then you have a net loss of something. If it's a net loss of a particle, the black hole is losing mass. If it's the net loss of an antiparticle, that antiparticle will annihilate with the normal matter nearby, producing radiation, and so radiation has left the black hole. So in either scenario, you're either radiating or losing mass, and in fact, both happen, and so you have a black hole that has a small amount of radiation, Hawking radiation, and is losing mass slowly by this process. So it's, the, it's not like something for nothing. The nothing is actually from the vacuum of space. Uh, and that's a way of essentially extracting mass and energy from the black hole itself and thereby diminishing it. Ready for the next question. Thanks, Chris. Um, the next question comes from a live viewer, Bipasha Amin, who would like to know if you can talk about any of the simulation software that's used in Stewart Observatory and <clears throat> um, what, uh, what kinds of software are now state of the art uh, in um, simulations. Uh, yeah, so Stuart is, uh, and the, uh, the Department of Astronomy at my university has a lot of expertise in hydrodynamic simulations. Those are simulations that uh, not only include the mass of particles and gravity, but also include gas and radiation. So they have complex situations where they can handle gas, and they can even include magnetic fields, which is called magnetohydrodynamics. That's probably the most difficult thing to simulate. And these simulations with powerful computers, actually now mini supercomputers, um, they are often done on desktop clusters where you have a uh, a set of different computational cores, maybe 64 of these high-speed cores, each of which would be like a fast PC, working in harness, parallelized. I know you have to, of course, parallelize your code to make it run efficiently on that kind of hardware. These simulations are now able to do things like model the environment of a black hole. And so the group at, at University of Arizona that worked with the Event Horizon Telescope to produce images of the black hole this, earlier this year, they were using these computational methods to simulate what the black hole should look like. Another set of people at, at my department is using the same methods to model chunks of the universe, to look at how galaxies form, to look at the early evolution of the universe, um, to make predictions, for example, of what the James Webb Space Telescope might see in the era when the universe was maybe 10 or 15 times smaller and hotter than it is now, and the first galaxies were able to congeal out of the expanding gas that was cooling gradually enough for gravity to eventually take over. So these are the typical things that people do. Also, there's another set of people looking at violent evolution of stars and the uh, the physics of supernovae using simulations. So it's the same hardware and very similar types of software and code that look at all these different things. Ready for the next question. All right. Uh, the next question is from a live viewer. Uh, Richard Tennis would like to know if you can talk about the nature of the giant radio bubbles just discovered in the center of the Milky Way by the Meerkat telescope. Um, yes, these are interesting. These are hundreds of light years across, I think thousands of light years across. Um, 
Uh, Meerkat is, is a low frequency radio telescope in South Africa. A Meerkat is a, is a, um, a small creature. I, I saw them actually. I was in South Africa this spring and I saw a Meerkat by the side of the road. Um, so his telescope is named for that. That's an acronym, of course. Um, and it's making low frequency observations. Those radio waves do escape from the center of our galaxy. And it's a good way of looking at gas that's not super hot, not like a, a very hot plasma next to a black hole, but gas that could be shock heated by multiple supernovae or violent late stellar evolution events. And so the speculation of these bubbles is that the center of our galaxy we know has been more active in star formation than we see it now in the past. And in the past, those earlier generations of rapid star formation would have left but it deposited a lot of energy in the surrounding region due to a lot of supernovae going off, and the supernova energy bubbles and expanding gas bubbles would have overlapped and evacuated a very large region. So that's the speculation as to what we're seeing. So it's essentially a relic, an echo, or a remnant of an earlier region of rapid star formation in the center of our galaxy, which in its turn was probably triggered by an active phase of the central black hole. Ready for the next question. All right. The next question is from Keith Miller, who sent an email asking, what exactly are carbon stars? Uh, carbon stars are stars that have more than the typical amount of carbon. It's, it's a sort of loose jargon term in astronomy. They, they tend to be massive evolved stars. So uh, a star like the sun has, of course, some carbon in it based from previous generations of stars creating carbon because the sun will entomb carbon and not return it into the interstellar medium. There are, however, stars that include more than a typical amount of carbon, carbon being about one atom per three or 400 hydrogen atoms in the universe, so it's a trace element. Um, so carbon stars have either got more carbon than is typical for a star, just because of the region of the galaxy they were created in having a larger heavy element abundance than is typical, or they're stars that have created a lot of carbon and cycled it into their envelopes. That second definition is usually what people mean when they're carbon stars. And so these tend to be massive stars, evolved stars, who've gone up the fusion chain beyond where the sun will typically go and have started creating carbon uh, from helium, which is the, the next stage of fusion after going from hydrogen to helium. Uh, they're interesting because they tell us about how evolved stars work. They also tell us where a lot of the carbon in the universe came from. And since carbon is essential for life, they are telling part of the story of biology in the universe. Ready for the next question. Um, there are two people uh, on with us live who have questions about interstellar uh, asteroids and visitors uh, like these uh, asteroids that uh, there was this Oumuamua that approached Earth and then somehow seemed to propel itself in another direction. And then recently in the news, <clears throat> um, there have been articles about an, a possible interstellar comet. And um, they're wondering if you could explain how these things occur and uh, what we know about them and whether that's true. So there are interstellar uh, travelers and therefore visitors between star systems. Uh, it, it, this is easier to happen for a comet because comets are form an ex a huge cloud, the outer periphery of our solar system extending 30, 50, maybe even 80,000 times the Earth-Sun distance, and a quasi-spherical cloud called the Oort cloud. Um, if stars come relatively close to each other in the solar neighborhood, then their gravitational interaction can easily perturb the comet cloud. And it will do two things. It can send some comets coming into inner solar system orbits and can potentially coming close to the Earth. And it can eject some comets from the edge of that solar system because they're quite loose, loosely bound by gravity. Those ejected comets will travel through interstellar space and there's some finite possibility that they could be captured by another star. So it's certainly possible for comets to be liberated from one star, the edge of one star system, and be captured by another one. Uh, for asteroids, it's a lot lower probability event because asteroids are sort of rocky debris left over well within the solar system, and in our case, of course, in the solar system we live in, it's a few times the Earth's on distance. Uh, 
those asteroids don't typically leave their zone where they sit there as debris. Maybe you could call them a failed planet. To sweep up all the asteroids in the asteroid belt. It's about 4% of the Earth mass. Uh, but those asteroids can collide with each other. They can interact gravitationally. And there's a finite probability that an asteroid can get ejected from an inner solar system, thereby traveling through interstellar space. Uh, the odds of an asteroid doing that and then being captured by another star system are exceptionally low. It's not even clear whether that's a real mechanism for asteroids moving between star systems. Ready for the next question. Uh, the next question is from Ruslan, who's on with us live, who asks, uh, due to the expansion of the universe in a trillion years, for example, we will not be able to see the light from any stars or any other galaxies outside of our Milky Way. So um, <clears throat> how will scientists of the future be able to <clears throat> do research and prove that there's more than one galaxy? Uh, good question. And the an simple answer is they won't because uh, our horizon, what this is referring to is the fact that in an accelerating universe, the horizon, which is the limit you can see, in other words, the most distant object from which light can reach us in the age of the universe, and if those distant objects are moving away faster than light, that light will never reach us. That horizon is gradually going to come closer to us until it takes away from view all the galaxies. The Milky Way and Andromeda, which are approaching each other at about 100 kilometers per second, will merge in about three or four billion years. And so that, they will form a big super galaxy that gradually settles out into almost an elliptical galaxy. And then everything else there'll be a few dwarf galaxies left over and they may eventually merge with us and then everything else will be gone. Um, so short answer is no, there'll be no obvious way to know that there was a universe of galaxies out there. It'll just look like your one big post Milky Way system. Ready for the next question. Next question is from Debaparna Goswami who sent an email asking, how do we know that there are no undiscovered parts of the electromagnetic spectrum? Are there any frequencies yet to be discovered? Um, that's a good question. The electromagnetic spectrum is a continuum of wavelength, energy, and frequency. Um, and it, it, at the end, it becomes a matter of detection technique at the two extremes. At the low energy extreme, uh, astronomers routinely work with meter length radio waves. That's the longest wavelength uh, radio waves we can detect with dipole type antennas or simple radio telescopes, these radio waves are actually trapped by the Earth's atmosphere, so you can't really do external astronomy with them. Um, and in principle, you could have radio waves of tens of meters or hundreds of meters or, or extremely low energy radio waves. And at that point, it just becomes a difficulty of detection because the energy of the waves are just so low. But there's no theoretical limit to the to a very, very low energy, very, very long wavelength electromagnetic wave. They may exist in the universe. At the high energy end, obviously, it goes into gamma rays, and the highest energy electromagnetic radiation we've seen is, is from high energy phenomena like the environment of black holes, um, the surface of neutron stars, etc. So there are places where gamma rays are produced in the universe. And again, there's no theoretical limit upper bound on these gamma rays, eventually they uh, become high enough energy that we also have difficulty detecting them. X-ray and gamma ray detectors have finite uh, wavelength ranges they're sensitive to, so we just lose the ability to detect them. But there's no theoretical limit, either low or high, to electromagnetic waves. Ready for the next question. Um, our next question is from a live <clears throat> viewer named Chandran who asks, is there an inner and outer halo in the Milky Way? And if so, where is the dividing line? And is there a difference in the properties of the objects, the stars between those two regions? Um, different researchers don't actually agree on this topic. I mean, in general, the Milky Way just has one dark matter halo. Um, there's no discontinuity. If you if you make a model of the rotation of stars in the Milky Way, which diagnoses the fact that there is a dark matter halo, and you decompose the visible matter, which is declining as you go out with the dark matter, that's either constant or slightly declining, there's no cusp or inversion or 
change of profile that suggests there are two separate components to the Milky Way. So I, th I think the simple answer is that there's no evidence for a two-component Milky Way halo. Um, but galaxies, of course, have grown by mergers. And it is possible, and not in the case of Milky Way, but in case of other galaxies, that the dark matter could have two distinct components, inner and outer, or counter-rotating, for example, just because of the merger history of those galaxies, the dark matter uh, of each galaxy would have its own particular rotation properties and radial profile. And there is evidence of that in other galaxies. Ready for the next question. The next question is from Tom Story, who's on with us live. Um, and he recently had an opportunity to look at a large quantum computer that was cooled with helium-3, they said. And that got him thinking about helium-3. What is it? Why is it important? Um, how rare is it, and why does everyone talk about it as a reason to go back to the moon? Um, helium-3 is an isotope of helium. Uh, regular, normal, stable helium is, is helium-4, two protons and uh, two neutrons. Helium-3 um, is, is, has one less nucleon, and so it's an isotope, which means it's radioactive. Um, the reason it's valuable is it's, it's very good fuel, because if you want to make nuclear fuel, helium-3 is a good starting point for that because it's relatively easy to get it to fuse since it has the one proton, so the electrical repulsion is not nearly as high as when helium nuclei, normal helium nuclei, are fusing. So helium-3 is potentially a good energy source of the far future when we're actually making a fusion, a routine matter for our energy. And in particular, when we want to do spacecraft that can travel between stars, we're almost certainly going to need fusion engines rather than the chemical rockets we have now. Now, the Earth, uh, Earth's moon has helium-3, and the helium-3 is made that way, uh, recognizing it's, it's not a stable situation, uh, from high-energy particles that come in. So helium-3 exists very near the surface of the moon in the, in the lunar regolith. Um, but of course, over a long period of time, the moon ha having no atmosphere, quite a large amount of helium-3 has been created on the moon's surface. And, and, and that's why it's a, sig a significant resource, because that amount of helium-3 does not exist on the Earth, and creating it or manufacturing it is a very expensive process. So the moon has all this sort of free, if you can get there, helium-3, and that makes it very interesting to some people for the future of space travel. Ready for the next question. Uh, the next question is from Ronan Lesargent from Paris, uh, who asks uh, via email, is it correct to say that the universe expands, meaning that it is finite in some way and expanding, or is it that the baryonic matter expands in an infinite universe? If it's the matter, then shouldn't we be able to go backwards to the time of the Big Bang and find out where it came from and where the center of all of that matter is? Uh, two things. Uh, the m baryonic matter itself is not expanding. So the matter uh, stays in its a stable configuration. The neutral matter, of course, has electrons bound to the nuclear particles. So the expansion of the universe does not affect the stability of normal matter. So it's not the matter itself that's expanding. It's the space-time that's expanding. And the expanding space-time of the expanding universe, the accelerating expansion of the universe, carries particles, normal particles, dark matter particles, whatever the universe contains, further and further apart from each other. And it's doing that in an accelerating way. So that's sort of how we characterize the expansion. Ready for the next question. Um, the next question is from Shoshin, who is on with us live, who uh, recently heard uh, in a podcast that um, mathematical models, computer models, cannot yet be used to understand what happens when a star goes nova. And his question is, how come the, how, why is it that this is more complex than other occurrences uh, that can be put into computer models? Uh, nova is a sort of late stage of a star where um, fusion occurs on the stellar atmosphere and sends an envelope out into space that then cools and falls back on the star. So you have either a periodic or quasi-periodic um, phenomenon or where the star flares in a fusion event, and we see that as an intense brightening of the star. 
Nova means, you know, as a new star basically appearing in the sky. <clears throat> the reason <clears throat> it's not impossible to model, and astronomers do have three dimensional models of novae and supernovae. Um, it's difficult though because it's not a strictly periodic process. It's kind of messy and chaotic. It's also not a completely symmetric process um, because the star is rotating and has non uniform density, and so it's not a strictly spherical uh, outflow and then recollapse. So it just has enough complexity and asymmetry uh, and magnetic fields may be important in what happens, and they're very hard to model in three dimensions, that it's does hit the edge of what computation can do. But I wouldn't say it's impossible to model. Ready for the next question. The next question is from Alexis Frey, who's on with us live, who would like to know if there is a limit to how far an active black hole's radiation jet can reach. Um, it depends a little bit on the size of the black hole. If we're talking about a stellar mass black hole, um, the jets can punch out uh, from the immediate vicinity where the accretion occurs. It sort of depends on the ambient density. If they're in a low density region of our galaxy, where the particle density in interstellar space, typically one to 10 atoms or protons per cubic centimeter, but you can have low density regions which are 100 times less than that. In those situations, I think black hole jets can travel uh, light years, uh, several light years, maybe 10 or 20 light years, and we've seen a few examples of that. If you're talking about the massive black holes at the center of galaxies, that's interesting too, because if they're in an elliptical galaxy where there's very little gas to impede the flow of the jet, the relativistic jet can punch well out of the galaxy into the intergalactic medium. So we've ex seen examples of massive black hole jets that travel millions of light years. That, that's a huge distance. Remember, the distance between the Milky Way and Andromeda is uh, two and a quarter million light years. So we're talking about jets that can punch out of a single galaxy almost as far as the next typical galaxy would be. So that's quite spectacular for the biggest black holes. Ready for the next question. Uh, the next question is from Simon, um, who's on with us live, who asks, uh, what do you think about Eric Verlin's theory that gravity is emergent and that information is the true building block on which everything in the universe is made? So these are ideas that have been around for a while, and Eric Verlin is one of the people. Uh, Max Tegmark is another um, person who's put ideas like this, which are sort of the, the fundamental essential elements of the universe are, are strictly mathematical. This is a sort of platonic idea, so harking back to Plato, the original Greek philosophers, which said that number geometry is everything and at the base of existence. Pythagoras said the same thing too in the ancient Greek era. Um, so there are modern physicists who take this view too, um, going beyond the physical objects of the universe to their mathematical underpinnings seems to be a way of getting at the most fundamental aspects of nature. Um, the theory is interesting, but it has to be held to a scientific standard, which really would ask, what does it predict? What uniquely does this view of nature predict that wouldn't be predicted, say, by the standard model of particle physics? And as yet, I don't think these theories have made unique predictions that lead people to convince they must be correct. Ready for the next question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the next question from a live viewer, Dev Writer, um, is what are the current frontiers of dark matter studies? The current frontier involves identifying the subatomic fundamental particle that we think is dark matter. So dark matter is not macroscopic objects. It's not collapsed stars like, um, it's not like white dwarfs or brown dwarfs or black dwarfs or black holes. Uh, it's not intermediate objects like planets um, or dark rocks or even interstellar dust particles. All the elimination of those possibilities leave only the possibility of a subatomic fundamental particle. And so there's a currently a set of experiments, mostly in physics labs and often deep underground to protect from contaminating signals by cosmic rays, um, trying to look for various candidate Particles. Perhaps the most promising subatomic particle is the, the lowest mass stable particle that results from supersymmetry, from the merger of the three forces of nature in supersymmetry theories that have been around for a few decades and we haven't confirmed them yet. Uh, but that's a, a hot 
candidate for dark matter, although the dark matter particle ironically is cold, which means subrelativistic at the time of decoupling. Um, none of those experiments have succeeded, uh, but they, they're very difficult to do because the interaction of dark matter with normal matter, of course, is weak. It doesn't uh, interact with the electromagnetic process. Um, so I would say we're a couple of years away from those experiments either succeeding, in which case we know what dark matter is, what kind of particle it is, or failing, <clears throat> in which case it's almost back to the drawing board. Ready for the next question. Uh, the next question is from a live viewer, Abantiki, uh, Abantika, who's on with us live, who has a question about the recent Chandra, uh, Chandrayaan-2 mission that uh, was from the Indian Space Agency that tried to land on the moon. Communications with the lander were lost. Um, have you been following it? Do you think that there's a possibility of getting communications restored? Do you know anything about the latest state? Not uh, in the la not from the last eight or ten hours. I read stories about this online yesterday. Um, they have not succeeded in in getting back communication with the satellite they, uh, with the lander. They they lost contact at a very inopportune time in the mission which led them to conclude at that time that the mission was lost, that it had crash landed or that it would never be recoverable in the sense of not being able to communicate with it. They do now have indications that it's on the surface and that it's live, that, it's, that it's, they can receive signals from it, but they can't communicate it with it in a standard way with normal telemetry or complex information that lets them control the lander and understand its physical state. So at the moment, that that's not a good sign. That doesn't mean that it's a viable mission sitting there on the surface, even if it's not absolutely dead. So things don't look good, but it's maybe a little too early to tell. Ready for the next question. Um, Gautam Sant, who's on with us live, would like to know if there are any black holes near the Earth and um, if the gravitational pull, like what, how strong is the gravitational pull from a black hole? And it seems like there's a concern about um, how close it might be to Earth and uh, the gravitational pull, you know, doing some kind of damage to Earth. Right. Um, black holes are rare. So black hole forms when a star that was originally the mass, about 10 times the mass of the sun, loses some mass along the way and then leaves behind a remnant that's three or more times the mass of the sun. And only about one in a thousand stars are this massive or more massive. So that, that's a very small fraction of all stars that end as a black hole. And the logic followed through, therefore, is that the nearest example, you wouldn't expect to be very close. Several hundred light years is what you'd expect if only one in a thousand stars are black holes. Um, and indeed, the nearest examples we found are a few hundred light years away. The nearest good example, uh, Cygnus X1, is several thousand light years away. And so most of the candidate black holes we know of, which are only about 50 or 60 really good cases, are actually a couple of thousand light years away rather than a few hundred. So, and we don't expect to find any closer. It would be very unusual or just lucky or a fluke if we did find one closer. So the nearest black holes are, are, are far, hundreds and hundreds of stars are closer. Uh, and the gravity of those black holes is, of course, not dramatic. At, the, at a large distance, you don't have any weird effects from general relativity. They just have the gravity of a star of that mass, which is three or four times the mass of the sun. And a star of that mass hundreds of light years away really has a, a puny effect on our solar system. So in that sense, black holes really are not very noteworthy in terms of their gravity at the large distances of the nearest ones. Ready for the next question. The next question is from Ryan Weber, who is on with us live, who would like to know if it is possible for a star to become a black hole without exploding in a supernova. Uh, we think not, because the pathway to form a black hole has as its starting point uh, a star that, as I said before, is about eight to ten times the mass of the sun. Um, that's the only star that, by late in its life, having exhausted all its nuclear fusion, can have enough density and gravity in the core to pull down the central state to a state where nothing can escape. So just the fact of creating something that meets the formal definition of a black hole implies a certain amount of initial mass. And so uh, we, we know what it takes to do that. And um, so we don't expect to see that occurring for most stars. It'll be a very unusual star that does that. 
ready for the next question. Um, the next question is from Eliezer, who's on with us live, who would like to know um, about there are two planets that were recently discovered very far away from Earth um, that have very elliptical orbits. Um, and uh, their question is, what could cause these planets to have such elliptical orbits um, around their stars? Highly elliptical orbit for a planet is usually not a result of the formation process because <clears throat> as well as we understand planet formation, it occurs by the nearly symmetric collapse of a large gas cloud uh, and the particles that orbit in the equatorial plane have orbits that are actually circularized. So as the planets are forming out of the gas and dust in a protostellar disk, the <clears throat> collisions and interactions between those particles if they had any non-circular motions, acts to damp out those non-circular motions. So you almost, uh, by natural physics principles, end up with uh, coplanar rotating disk particles in circular orbits. So once the planets have formed, however, they can go away from circular orbits for any number of reasons. And the typical reasons, of course, are interactions between the planets. So when multiple planets in a solar system interact with each other over their many hundreds or hundreds of thousands or millions of orbits in cosmic time, they can gradually uh, deviate from circularity. The other reason, and the more likely reason to make extreme elliptical orbits, is interaction with another star system or close passage of a nearby star, which will uh, add energy to the system or distort the orbit, change its angular momentum, and then you can get an extremely elliptical orbit. So that's the most likely mechanism. Ready for the next question. Uh, so Ramon has a question about some crystals in um, uh, uh, the Nica cave in Chihuahua, Mexico, and apparently um, would like to know if you have heard of these. Um, apparently they may have be made of lunar rocks, and um, is that possible um, for these crystals to be lunar in origin? So I haven't heard about this particular uh, cave or situation. It is, however, possible to have lunar rocks on the Earth. There are lunar meteorites. Uh, they're, they're rare, of course, because um, an, a meteor or asteroid or an impact on the moon would raise up material and it would have to then fall to the Earth. Uh, they're not as rare as Martian meteorites, who have to, which have to travel much further. So there are lunar meteorites known. The difficulty in recognizing them, of course, is they just look like rocks. And so it's really hard to know whether you're looking just at a regular rock um, they could have come out of, say, a volcano and still impacted the ground or a meteorite. Um, perhaps in this cave situation, there's something peculiar about the mineralogy or the geology that leads us to think that they might be moon rocks. When you look at the detailed crystallography and geochemistry of rocks, you can match them to the moon rocks, the 450 kilos of moon rocks brought back by the Apollo astronauts, and make a pretty good case that a particular rock is a moon rock. So that presumably has been done in this case. Ready for the next question. All right, uh, the next question comes from Kusanagi, who is on with us live, who asks, um, uh, who says, I have heard that many cracks on other planets and moons come from the shrinking of the surface due to the cooling of the planet. Um, is this still occurring on our moon? Is it shrinking? Um, no, and the moon is geologically dead. So the moon has had activity in the past, mostly in the distant past. Um, but the moon is so small, although it does have some internal heating, of course, there's radioactive decay occurring in the rocks of the moon that causes mild heating. It's not sufficient for tectonic activity or creating a magma or anything like that. Uh, the moon does have geological stresses. It's in a non-circular orbit of the Earth, so it can have stresses caused by its orbit of the Earth. Um, uh, but it's not geologically active in any real sense. Ready for the next question. All right. Um, the next question is from Tucci, who is on with us live, who is interested in astrobiology. Um, we got an email asking if you have any suggestions for astrobiology like biology topics that are interesting to study at the PhD level. Um, and then um, they would also like to know if you know of any simulation software that's used for simulating extraterrestrial life. Um, 
So for biology topics within astrobiology, uh, you know, one of the most important topics is still how did life start on Earth? So if you do not have physical evidence of how life started on Earth, the uh, progress that's being made in understanding how you go from simple chemical ingredients to a single primitive cell involves either a computational approach, so some of this research can be done computationally, it's making simulation or theoretical biology, and some of it is done in the lab. Uh, so lab scientists are actually using um, tiny clay particles as nucleation sites for molecules becoming more complex. They're putting in the simple chemical ingredients, they're adding energy to the situation from ultraviolet radiation or just heat, uh, and seeing what happens. And so those are two approaches to the formation of life that are still very active and where the big questions have not yet been answered. So that's a biological approach to astrobiology. It's a little hard to talk about other biology topics for astrobiology because, of course, biology is really focused heavily on the biology of the Earth, the particular historical circumstance that led to life on Earth, where all the life on Earth, whatever, from a microbe to an elephant to a human, is one thing. We simply don't know that biology elsewhere will have the same chemical or biochemical basis as life on Earth. So it's a little risky, especially if it's a PhD project for a graduate student, to do too much speculative research based on the model or the template of life on Earth when we simply don't know how that applies out in the universe. So that's what I'd say about research topics in astrobiology for, for graduate students. Ready for the next question. Thank you, Chris. Um, so Jose has a follow-up question about the um, the atmosphere or the the planet, the exoplanet with the water in its atmosphere. And the question is, is there a threshold on gravity that would allow life to exist on a planet, either an upper bound or a lower bound? A threshold. I missed a word there. A threshold. I'm what? sorry. Um, a threshold on the, its mass, so the gravity. Um, the gravitational size of a, of a planet that would right. allow life to exist? That is not clear that there is a mass or gravity threshold. I think the bounds on life are more likely to be determined by just by temperature. If the temperature is too low and everything's frozen, there's not enough mobility of molecules to create complexity in life. If the temperature is too high, um, then it essentially becomes steam or gas or vapor. Um, also, you can have a replicating information storing molecule like DNA if the temperature is much above like 130 degrees C. So those are the strict bound. The strict bound is the one on temperature. The bounds based on gravity or equivalently on pressure are, are much less clear because there are life forms on Earth that exist within the deep sea oceans at temperatures of hundreds of degrees, but also at pressures of hundreds of atmospheres. And there's life that exists pretty much on the highest mountains on the Earth where the pressure is less than 10% of sea level. So pressure and gravity are, are weaker constraints uh, on life than temperature. Ready for the next question? It might have to be the last one. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so let's, let me check to see what our latest ones are. Um, I think that the last question is going to be, generally, uh, do you have any news on um, Planet Nine? Um, that the latest talks from um, uh, Dr. Brown and Badigan are almost a year old. So have you heard anything recent about that? Well, unfortunately, it's a simple and quick question to answer because no, there is no, there's no discovery of Planet Nine. Um, the surveys that could potentially find a large planet out in the outer solar system that had been previously missed are underway. They're all five to eight year difficult, long, scale, long time scale, tedious data reduction projects that have simply not succeeded. And I think we start from a skeptical stance. There's no real strong evidence that there should be a Planet Nine, anything substantial. There, there's, not, there's nothing very unexplained about the orbits of the outer planets that we already know of that would implicate a Planet Nine. So I'm in that skeptical camp too, and I don't really expect these searches to find anything. So that's all for this week. Thanks for your questions. Great as always, covering a wide range of topics, and we'll be back with you in a few weeks. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is Matthew, and Alexander was here doing all of the technical stuff. We 
I really appreciate you joining us, and we hope you, if you're taking the class on Udemy or Coursera, we hope you enjoy the rest of the class um, and um, or the astrobiology class on Coursera. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks again.